The teaching text is from Titus chapters 1, verses 10 to 16, and it reads as follows. For there are many rebellious people, full of empty talk and deception, especially those from the circumcision party. It is necessary to silence them. They are ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, rebuke them sharply, so that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commands of people who reject the truth. To the pure, everything is pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and conscience are defiled. They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. This is the word of the Lord. Kuyamora Dumela Saubona Hita. Really nice. Thank you, church. My name is Nisejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as an elder. This morning, I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you as we continue in the book of Titus. So, today is part three of six. We are halfway there as we look at the book of Titus and what those implications are for us. Weave or Natural, Steers or Burger King, Netflix or DSTV, Twitter or Instagram, public or private healthcare, cancel culture or call out culture, chiefs or pirates, ANC or DA, capitalism or communism. Many of the words or terms that I used now are enough to split rooms, split families, split friendships, as people pick what they prefer or what they like. Some of these divide to the point of conflict and some may feel or produce a right or wrong position, um, like pirates being wrong and Brazil being right for the World Cup, which starts this evening, or maybe even squeezing toothpaste in the middle being definitely wrong when you can squeeze it from the bottom up. Um, In life, generally, we have differences. Um, Too many things. However, this morning, as we engage the text, we will see that some things can't have preference. Some things are a matter of right and wrong. Some things don't have your truth or my truth. This morning, we will see how as followers of Jesus, we ought to respond in a divided space, in a polarized context. Crete is a divided city. There are many false teachers who claim to know God but have no fruit in their lives. Some people believe these false teachers and families are destroyed. Paul says there ought to be fruit that resembles the faith in God. There ought to be a behavioral change from the belief. Remember a quote by Charles Spurgeon, which says, Let us never think we have learned a doctrine until we see its fruit in our lives. Let us never think we have learned a doctrine until we see its fruit in our lives. This may just be a quote for the series. Paul says there is wrong and right. Paul says, if you claim to know God but have no fruit, you are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for good work. Paul isn't playing around. He isn't mincing his words. He is very direct. Paul says, if you're a false teacher, a liar, evil, and dishonest, you must be rebuked, brought back to sound teaching. Paul says those entrusted with the good news should discern and bring the gospel to those who are in the wrong or those who have strayed from the gospel. This morning we have four points. As we engage the text, we'll, we'll do a recap and background of the main audience. I think it's important for us to understand the main context or the main audience as we get to this text, to understand the language that Paul uses. So we'll do a recap and background, and then we'll do line by line exegesis. Jesus. So we'll move through the text line by line and see what Paul is actually saying in this text. When we do that, when we go line by line, we'll see two things. We'll see false teacher's character, We'll see what elders should do with false teachers. And then we'll look at observations from the text and implications. So recap, 
line by line, observations from the text and implications for the church. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can come together to fellowship, to sing songs of praise and worship to you. We pray that this morning as we sit now to hear from you through your word, um, that you would use me as a vessel of honor for your glory, that you would speak through me, that you would touch my heart and touch the heart of your people, that you would encourage where you encourage, that you would rebuke where you rebuke, and that you would center us around the hope of eternal life from God our Savior. Pray against any distractions this morning. Help us to focus on you. In Jesus' name we pray. <coughs> Amen. This morning we, we focus on what elected leaders should do according to Paul as he instructs Titus and the people of the church. Also how these leaders should affect the people under their care. You may be sitting here this morning thinking, what is this letter or teaching has to do with me? I'm not a leader or I'm not an elder. You may think that this letter is for Reino or for myself or other church leaders that we should be reading this letter and learning from it. I do want to encourage you not to check out this morning. This letter is also for you. It has implications for you as an individual and it has implications for the church. Paul is writing to Titus, but also to the churches of Crete. And we see that in Titus chapter 3, verse 15. Paul says, grace be with you all. That's the greeting that Paul ends the letter with. So this letter is written to Titus from Paul, but it's going to be read in the churches. The churches are going to grapple with this text. And that is why there's implications for us this morning. Implications for the individual and implications for the church. Our feature passage starts with the word for, which is a conjunction. So we don't only teach the gospel up front, every now and then we add some grammar. The word for is a conjunction in the English language, which means it's joining two or more clauses and sentences. In this instance, the word joins verses 10 to 16, a different idea to verses Five, and, uh, five to nine, which Reino did for us last week. So we ought to know what has come before verses 10 to 16 to understand this conjunction. So two weeks back, we started with an overview of Titus, knowing that Paul wrote the book to Titus to instruct him to appoint elders to continue the work that they, Paul and Titus, had started. He should do so in order to further the work of the gospel. He should do so in order to further the knowledge of those God has chosen so that they grow in godliness because of the hope of eternal life. So last week we learned more about the qualifications of those who should lead the church and continue the work of the gospel in teaching it. This includes a list of vices or disqualifiers and non-vices or qualifiers. So namely an individual who is blameless, faithful to his wife and who's able to lead his home. These are qualities that are necessary for leaders and qualities to what is spoken about in Timothy and Peter as well. So these are similar qualities that Paul or other parts of Scripture have vocalized about the qualities of a leader. If you miss the sermon, please feel free to catch this on YouTube or your favorite audio podcast platform. Let's look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, But hospital, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught, so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and to refute those who contradict it. This is part of what Reino taught last week. So the command for elders and leaders of the church is that they should hold firmly to the trustworthy message. This message has been entrusted to them so that they encourage others using this message and they refute those who oppose this message with the message. The message of a savior God who promised eternal life before the ages began and fulfilled the promise through Jesus Christ, who was sinless, came to earth as a man, died for you and me, and rose again on the third day as part of fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. This promise of eternal life made by God who doesn't lie, and we see this in, in Titus 1 verse 2, this is the message the elder should hold firmly to. 
hope of eternal life through God our Savior. Paul's concern throughout the letter is that there's a group of people that are destroying the work of the gospel. He's concerned about the people of Crete. He wants them to live in the hope of eternal life through a Savior God, and he wants them to adorn the doctrine of God as Savior, which means to magnify or make him known, that word adorn. So he wants them to make known or magnify God who is Savior. So the word for, which is a conjunction, joins the qualifications of leaders. You should see a slide behind me. The qualifications of leaders, the character of leaders, and the command of leaders, which is part of verses 5 to 9, to 10 to 16, which has its main idea in verse 16, that there's a group of people who claim to know God, a group of people who are, who are like wolves in sheep's clothing. They speak about God, but they deny him in what they do. So elders and leaders should rebuke them, and we will see how and why they should do so. Let me read our main passage again as we grapple through it. For there are many rebellious people full of empty talk and deception, especially those from the circumcision party. It is necessary to silence them. They are ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and commands of people who reject the truth. To the pure, everything is pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. To understand this question, we need to understand as well a little bit more about the Cretans. As you listen, you may think that there are remarkable similarities to nations or people groups that you know in, two, uh, in, 20, uh, in this year to, to Cretans and Cretan culture back from 2,000 years ago. The Greek word for being a liar is Gretizio, which is a, a Cretan. That's what it means. It means to be a Cretan. So that is how they're known they coined the term liar. The Cretan people are known for treachery. They are known for betrayal, known for greed. Most of the men had served as mercenary soldiers. They made money at the expense of ethics. They made money at the expense of ethics. They were served to the highest bidder. The cities were known to be unsafe, to be violent and sexually corrupt. They are so bad that we see one of their own prophets. It is clear from the way that Paul writes that he was not a true prophet of God, but rather someone the Cretans chose to call prophet. So one they call a prophet themselves says Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Imagine that. This is like one of the world's best soccer players, Cristiano Ronaldo, who started his career at Manchester United. He was made a global superstar in his early years because of the success, support, and love of the club. He recently spoke of the lack of love and care the owners have for the club and also negatively about the owners. Like Donald Trump, who enjoyed a big following early on in his presidency, but towards the end enjoy, enjoyed the lowest ratings of a president. Also, also due to explosive comments he made about people that he previously enjoyed their favor. One tweet speaking about his IQ being the highest and telling people not to feel stupid because it's not their fault. So think about this prophet, instilled by the people of Crete, but he has some bombshells to drop about the people that declared him prophet. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So some of the problems of the church in Crete is that they have assimilated or joined their belief of Jesus to the cultural beliefs in other Greek gods that they grew up knowing. One of the gods was Zeus, who Cretans believed was born on their island. They, they, they would tell of his underhanded character, namely as one who loved women and would lie to get his way. Another culture deviation is seen through the circumcision party. The Cretans would say that they believed and followed Jesus. Some of the Jews would demand that non-Jewish 
Christians be circumcised as a rite of passage to being a follower of Jesus. So they're incorrectly saying Jesus is not enough and you need to be circumcised also and you need to follow the laws of the Torah. So the Cretans are letting culture transform them instead of them transforming culture through the gospel. This is the culture and background of the people of Crete. So Paul instructs Titus to elect elders and for them to guard doctrine. He also defines what or who the false teachers are. Those Titus ought to rebuke sharply. So he gives some character traits in there. He says they're rebellious, empty talk, and deception. So rebellious, what, what does Paul mean when he says rebellious? That's, that's a great question. Firstly, it's important to see that Paul says many as well, so many false prophets. So there's a large number of these false prophets. Paul then speaks about the character of these false prophets, and he says they're rebellious because they don't submit to the authority of the apostles' teaching and don't submit to the authority of the Word of God. These rebellious people are also teaching Jewish myths. myths. They, are, they are teaching that people need to follow the Torah. People need to commit to these Jewish myths and practices if they want to grow or be followers of Jesus. So just a quick side road. When you look at the first four verses of the letter, there's no sense that Paul teaches his own ideas or fine-sounding arguments. He says he's teaching the Word of God. Rebellious people, including those who don't faithfully teach the Word of God, who may teach a whole sermon without Bible references, or preach a Bible passage and teach the opposite of that passage, or those who teach inspirational messages that are void of our need for Christ and His death on the cross, or maybe those who change, who change entire sermons while walking up to the, to the pulpit to preach because surely the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit was still with them while they were preparing. God is not surprised who's sitting in front of a preacher in the morning. So if you ever hear me say I was going to preach Titus, but the Holy Spirit let me prepare, and now I have a fresh word for you, then feel free to raise a hand and prompt where the Holy Spirit was during my prep. So Reino mentioned last week that we too should be held to the standard seen in this text and the guidelines of Paul. We should preach only what the Bible teaches, not our own ideas, not our feelings void of the gospel. We say we're a gospel-centered church, and if we stand up front and not teach Christ crucified for you and me, then we need to be put straight. I've walked into many a church and left confused that was what was being taught, or maybe the lack of Jesus in, in the context or lack of sin, or left the church encouraged or hearing this tone of greatness in me. which is not true. Christ is good and only Christ is great. I hope that is not how many of you walk out each Sunday morning feeling confused about the message or lacking in the doctrine of God as Savior. Don't get me wrong, there is room for a sermon to be encouraging, but it should be through the gospel, through the grace of God, through the cross of Christ, which is enough. Okay, back to Paul. So Paul says no. Paul says this is wrong. Rebuke these people. Rebuke the rebellious people. Paul mentions empty talk as well. In the Greek, empty talk um, is mataliochi. This means idle talk or one who utters empty and senseless things. It means idle talker or one who utters empty or senseless things. They too just just talk, talk a lot, talk loud, no substance, and still deceive. Like you would have heard a saying that says, empty cans make the loudest noise. Deception here means making people accept what is not true, like those for the circumcision party. They're adding Jewish customs to the gospel. They're deceiving people and teaching that circumcision and the Torah are rite of passage to being a follower of Jesus. They're adding practices to the gospel and deceiving people. There are many examples of, even in South Africa, of false prophets who live within these same character traits. 
They're all rebellious because they reject the completeness of Jesus' death on the cross to save people. They're examples of empty talk and deception. There are many famous cases of, of false teachers who sexually abuse people because of the lies that these heinous acts can cure or heal. Some take money from the poor, asking them to sow, and God would repay their seed, but they misuse the money of God. Some show acts of healing which are staged, people acting healed from sickness they didn't actually have, or ask people to drink petrol or use doom on people as acts of healing. These are false teachers who are rebellious, empty talkers, and deceptive. Don't get me wrong, God does heal. At Fellowship City, we pray for people who want healing. We don't ask for money or ask the people to jump through hoops because God doesn't need the theatrics to heal. God, doesn't, God does bless his people as well at Fellowship City. We pray for, for God to do just that, and we have seen his loving hand both in acts of healing and in provision. Paul then speaks about what, we should, what, should, uh, what should happen to the false teachers and why. So he's already spoken about the character traits. Now, now he speaks about what should happen to these false teachers and why. We see the first in verses 11 and the second in verses 13 to 16. It is necessary to silence them. They are ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. Silence them. They are ruining entire households. Here Paul could be referring to a group of homes that come together like a Bible study in, in common day language, or he could be referring to, to entire churches. We know in the context of Crete that the churches were made up of smaller house groups. The main point is that the false teachers are wrong. It's not about their truth or my truth. They're destroying families and lives by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. Remember, Cretans are mercenaries who make money at the expense of ethics. So Paul says they're wrong. And again, we don't have to look far to see this. Many people on the continent of Africa and South Africa are hopeless, trying to find meaning in life. Some are desperate. Some are trying to fight poverty. These false teachers then ruin households by bringing dishonesty and teaching what they shouldn't to fill these gaps of hope, gaps of desperation in order to get money. We have pastors who fly in private jets because they want to further the work of God. Some ask their people to donate towards this. I have trouble understanding if Jesus were here, would he fly in a private jet? I actually think he would fly in economy class so he can speak to the people and proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. Or pastors who have large self-help books. I wonder how often these books include Jesus crucified, Jesus alone, or Jesus hope of eternal life. Paul says, silence them. The false teachers are destructive. Verse 12. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. That's what Paul says. Paul agrees with this prophet. The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Again, we should see that this is not only a problem in Crete. If we turn on our TV or follow the news, you will see the same dis description of society at large. We'll see... False prophets, you'll see the same description. The second thing that Paul says to do with false teachers is to rebuke them. So not only silence them, but to rebuke them. Verse 13, for this reason, because of what has come before, because the false prophets are destructive, because Cretans are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, verse 13 says, for this reason, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and commands of people who reject the truth. So first, protect the church by silencing the false prophets, and then bring the gospel to them. Rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in the faith. Paul is saying the elders who are guarding doctrine should use the same doctrine to rebuke, same doctrine to make those who reject the truth sound in faith. This seems familiar. Paul said he was entrusted with teaching so that in knowledge of the truth, people would be godly. This is what he says in chapter one and two, in, in, in verse 1 and 2. Verse 15, to the pure, everything is pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. In fact, both their mind and conscience are defiled. 
They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, and unfit. So just a few observations from the text. Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 27 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of bones of the dead and every kind of impurity. It is the same for the false teachers. They may seem neat and polished on the outside, but without the gospel they are dead and their actions will show. They speak about and twist the word of God to suit themselves, to make themselves rich, to further their agenda. They speak about God and claim to know him, but their deeds are different. They don't obey his words. They deceive people. Again, that quote that we spoke about from Charles Spurgeon, let us never think we learned the doctrine until we see its fruit in our lives. If you claim that you know God, if you know the doctrine of God and Savior, then this should be visible. It certainly was not visible for the false teachers. Paul says to Titus, rebuke them sharply so that they may be sound in faith. So the message, the gospel, the doctrine of God as Savior is useful for bringing life to the lost. That's the first observation. The gospel, the doctrine of God as Savior is useful for bringing life to the lost. The language used and the words of Paul are hard. They are sharp. Why does he use such language? He speaks of liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. He says those that deny God with their works are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for good work. He says they should be rebuked, rebuked sharply. I think Paul uses this language because he sees this as a life or death situation. These churches that Paul and Titus have started have elements in them that are destroying families, leading people away from the hope of eternal life in God who is Savior. Paul sees this as a life or death situation because he knows that sound teaching leads to the knowledge of the truth, which leads to godliness, and these individuals within the church are not teaching the truth. These individuals are teaching that other Jewish practices and following the Torah are essential as a rite of passage for followers of Jesus. This teaching takes away from the grace of God. It takes away from the finished work of Christ. And this work is enough for salvation. Paul says in verse 1, God chooses the people for himself and we are part of those people through the promise of Abraham. So we don't have to be circumcised first to receive salvation. We don't have to follow the Torah to receive salvation. In Christ alone, believing in the, the, the finished work of Christ on the cross, hope of eternal life in God who is Savior alone. Not, a, not in ancestors either. Some cultures say that when things don't go your way, then you need a cleansing ceremony for the ancestors. No, this is not true. When people die, they stay dead. They are gone. In Christ alone, our hope is found, not in ancestors. Not in San Gomez as well. We need nothing else for our hope. We need no one else except Jesus Christ. In Christ alone, our hope is found. Not in privilege either. Privilege may get you access to exclusive jobs and positions, but there's only one way to eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So what does this mean for the church? This letter is for you. The church and all the individuals of the church must be a discerning people. The church and all the individuals of, of the church must be a discerning people, a people that can hear the difference between false teachers and leaders entrusted to teach knowledge of the truth which should build godliness. The church and all the individuals of the church must hold their leaders accountable. The church and all the individuals of the church must check that their leaders are blameless, husband of one wife, able to manage their children and households, Check that leaders are holding firm to the teaching entrusted to them, encouraging and rebuking those under their care. That is your role as an individual and as a church. The church and all the individuals of the church must respond to this message by holding the church accountable to not give false teachers a platform to speak, but also to rebuke them with the gospel. To do this, you need to know the word of God. You need to know the doctrine of God as Savior. The doctrine of God as Savior for the believer should be a sweet remembrance of what Jesus has done and eternal life we can look forward to. The gospel should transform culture and not culture influence the gospel. We should not hide or assimilate to culture. 
we should bring the knowledge of the gospel to culture. This means at times we should rebuke culture and the practices of culture. We should be framing the gospel as a solution to life's problems and gaps in cultural dominance. Lastly, you need to also check your heart. Check your own godliness. Are there areas in your own life where you deny Jesus? Where you say that you're a, that, that you're a believer in Jesus, but your actions do not show? Are there areas in your life that need the gospel so transformation happens? Are there areas in your life where you think you've learned the doctrine of God as Savior, but there is no fruit? If there are areas, God wants to transform these areas. And you can come to him. Let's pray. You may want to speak to God. You may want to tell him where you are. You may want to confess these areas in which God needs to transform through the gospel. I'll give a moment of silence before, we, before I close off in prayer. Lord, we thank you for God who is Savior. We thank you that you are Savior, that you sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins and to give us life and life abundantly. We thank you that the hope of eternal life is not from ourselves because it will be broken, but it is from you, Lord God, a God who never lies. We thank you that the hope of eternal life frames how we live. And I pray that you would continue to draw us nearer to yourself, that we would continue to grow in knowledge of you, that we would continue to hear the knowledge that leads to godliness. As we await this as we await your, your return, as we await when you return and we shall be with you. We thank you that we can come to you where there's areas in our lives where we need transformation, where we need the gospel to do the work. And we thank you that the Holy Spirit would continue that work. We pray that you would show us those areas that we need to repent of, that we need to bring to you so that the Holy Spirit can do that work. We pray that as a people, that you'd help us to grow in knowledge of you and hold leaders to account. That we would know the gospel and know how to use the gospel to build lives, to rebuke others, and to encourage others. We pray now that as we respond to this word, that the songs, the words that we would sing would be true of our hearts, that we would desire you to build us up in you, Lord God. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.